on stage tomorrow, and <clears throat> if you want to uh, pick his brain, he's coming. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Tesla Tech Extraordinary Technology Conference 2016. This is the Thursday evening, uh, the Thursday evening um, <clears throat> presentation tonight. Tonight we have we have a slight change of schedule. We're going to be hearing from a definite conference favorite. He's going to be presenting something he's never presented before. Moray King is an amazing resource, an amazing researcher, an amazing man. Uh, I remember many many years ago. He gave me his books to uh, learn from and grow as I presented here for the very first time um, about uh, 13 years ago. So I want you to give a warm welcome to my friend, Moray King. Hey, Moray! Yeah. Oh, thank you. This is an absolute synchronistic miracle for me because I, I ran into this inventor. I just discovered him this year. Uh, it was a complete synchronistic miracle, and you'll see why on this talk. And, and it's, it's an absolute blessing that I can address the entire conference w with, with this information. And I'm so grateful, so grateful that you would all be here to, to share, share in this personal synchronistic miracle for me. I have a question. You just saw this video. How many think it's a fraud? Just put up your hands. Right. Okay. It's okay. The snipers can't see you in the back. How many think it runs on hydrogen? Just put up your hands. What if I tell you it doesn't use electrolysis? Vortex in the water and hydrogen. <laughs> you guys are good. You're anticipating everything I have in this presentation. Bingo. What if, how many think it's something else? Ooh, man, gosh, I'm speaking to the choir here. It's so much fun. Well, it's, I, I came to think it's something else, but prior to this, over 10 years of research on this HHO stuff, I, I went through all three, all three thoughts, all three beliefs. It's, it's a fraud, it's, it's hydrogen, or it's something else. And I'm going to share what that something else is. And obviously, it's related to nanobubbles. Over the years, many inventors have claimed to run gensets or engines on water. Now, you could Google, Google any one of these names and get a Big story on the internet about these inventors. But my personal favorite is the water car from Pakistan. Why? All because of what one reporter said. Why? It, when the physics professor said it violates the laws of thermodynamics, the reporter asked, why all the whining about violating the laws of thermodynamics? What law in Pakistan has not been violated? <laughs> Now that's attitude. <laughs> Why do people think it's fraud? This is obvious. Any trained engineer, any trained engineer knows that a closed roof running system that it relies on internal combustion of any fuel, hydrogen, gasoline, it doesn't really matter, of any fuel wastes more of its energy with heat loss, right? Typical gensets, especially if they're cheap, maybe 25% efficient, right? So therefore, to run a closed loop system exclusively on making hydrogen from the electrolyzer and all that, right, you, you lose 80% you lose 80, 80%, 80, 75% of your energy just in waste heat. So it's obviously such a system can't be closed loop. You're asking for a 4x or a 5x over unity just to self-run such a thing. 
It's clearly impossible. So I don't blame any engineer who understands normal science to ob object that such a thing cannot possibly exist. So it can be fraud. It can be easily classified as fraud. And most people that see that video ex ex exclaim exactly that without investigating any further. And that myths the inventor. They don't even investigate. They just declare fraud. Furthermore, it's well known if it's just hydrogen combustion, it's not even producing enough gas. Right, what does it take to run a car normally? 300 to 500 liters of uncompressed hydrogen. Uncompressed, right? These electrolyzers don't even come close to producing those amounts. And that's what you would take to run an internal combustion engine, especially if it's going to be a vehicle. So, Clearly, everyone who claims this has to be a screwball, a kook. It has to be fraud. And that's what they believe. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them the least because they know their standard science. Can it be hydrogen? Well, electrolysis can't exceed ex excess energy in and of itself. It's standard thermodynamics. It costs you more energy to break apart the water molecule than you'll ever get back by combusting it. Right? It just costs you more energy. Everybody knows that. Another way of looking at it is the water molecule is in a low energy state. Hydrogen is in a hydro higher energy state. Molecular hydrogen is a higher energy state still, not to mention it's unstable. Anything it contacts you know, goes back to normal molecular hydrogen, and of course, the plasma state's in a higher energy state still. There's no net energy gain here. Well, what about resonant dissociation? Wasn't that the trick? If I just can resonate it just at the right frequency of the hydrogen bonds, I could just break the part of water for free, right? Is resonance an, an energy source? What do you think? Is resonance a source of energy? If I stimulate it at the resonant energy, does it give me excess energy? What do you think? No. Yes, no. Yes, no. Right? But resonance is just a state of, a of, of the system. Right? The system has a natural resonant frequency. You can take very small inputs of energy at its frequency and gradually grow it at resonance if you feed it at the resonant frequency. So very small inputs indeed could grow a system, but the small inputs are still required, aren't they? Aren't they? So the energy source is the small inputs. So resonance itself is not an energy source, right? We need to have some input energy. Well, let's, let's find that resonance. Well, what's the resonance of the water molecule? Right? It's up there at the terahertz range. Terahertz. That's, that's in the infrared, right? And sure enough, if you stimulate water molecules at that frequency, indeed, you will disassociate the water. Is that what's happening in the electrolyzers that people are doing with? They're not even close to those frequencies, are they? Well, what about 42.8 kilohertz? Who heard of 42.8 kilohertz? Right? Why? Who's the, who's the inventor of 42.8 kilohertz? Just shout it out. Tesla? Tesla? Meyer? I heard Keeley. It's Keeley, right? Back at the turn of the century. Keeley says, I disassociate, disassociate everything. He breaks things apart at 42.8 kilohertz. Right? He, there's, there's newspaper accounts on breaking ropes. Right? Myers was mentioned. Myers was mentioned because Dale Pond told Stan Myers at one of the conferences, man, the, that Keeley resonance frequency is really something. It dissociates water. So what I did was I asked the Keeley experts who love doing Keeley research. These were, the, these were friends of mine 
I met over the years at the conferences, and I asked them, where does Keeley himself say that 42.8 megahertz, I'm sorry, kilohertz, disassociates water into hydrogen and oxygen? All I could find in the literature was that the disassociation frequency that he mentioned was down in the acoustical range, 620 hertz or 630 hertz. Some, some literature said 610. So I asked researchers, can you find me an original Keeley reference that said he disassociates it at 42.8 kilohertz? All they could find was the same thing I found, that he disassociates it, he talks of breaking anything, taking it right to ether. That's the way Keeley talked. He believed in ether. He never talked about the disassociating as to hydrogen and oxygen except at those acoustical frequencies. That was in the original Keeley literature. So the experts that I contacted on Keeley never mentioned that that would take it to hydrogen and oxygen. Right? But Dan Davidson, he's my favorite of the speakers, he spoke at the Tesla conference on many occasions, really put that 42.8 kilohertz on the map with the story of Dr. X. 1965, Dr. X did an extraordinary experiment. He created standing waves in a quartz tube. Quartz was very important. Keeley mentioned that when things were in quartz, they disassociated rather rapidly. Now, quartz, as you know, can ring, right? It rings like, like a glass. So we're ringing it at ultrasonic frequencies. So in this experiment, Dr. X was an actual professor who did not want his name known, associated with the event that occurred from this experiment. And this experiment, where he, he wanted to make a standing wave, a standing wave at the ultrasonic frequency in the 40 kilohertz region, he, uh, as the column evaporated, he would have to keep increasing the frequency to make the standing wave, and he had an adaptive circuit that would continually adjust the frequency appropriately, increasing it gradually as the column of water evaporated off the frame. And then he was recording in his lab book. And the last record he made was around 41 kilohertz. When he looked up at the experiment, he saw the water disappeared. He did not hear anything. He, just, he looked around on the bench, didn't see any water, then he looked up, and what he saw when he looked up was a hole in the ceiling. The hole was a perfect hole of the inner diameter of that quartz tube, approximately five, killer, uh, five centimeters. And when he investigated further, it punched itself all the way through the roof of the house, a perfect, a perfect hole. So he got scared, he got really scared. And he wouldn't research it again, but he did recruit Dan Davidson, who was a Keeley expert, to come in and, and investigate. He punched a hole through the thing. And so Dan Davidson has shared this story. He got it second hand, and you're getting third hand from me. So Dr. X to, to Dan Davidson to me. <laughs> you get the story of punching a hole, and, and he suspects it might be around the Keeley frequency of 42.8 kilohertz. So if you wish to, re to repeat and replicate this experiment in your apartment at home, I recommend that you use standard scientific protocol and warn the tenants upstairs. <laughs> Something like, coming through! <laughs> so could it be something else? So instead of tearing apart the water molecule at these frequencies, what if the ultrasonic frequencies are making something of the, in the water itself? In fact, that's what that inventor did of H2 Global. He does not use electrolysis. And this was the synergistic miracle for me. Because last year, I presented this, this talk 
over, uh, at many conferences, including at the Tesla conference and at the water conference in Bulgaria, that thunderclouds relating to zero point energy. And, and what I concluded was if you take thundercloud material and you put it and you put it into an internal combustion engine and give it a big plasma discharge, you mimic a thunderclap and you force that piston down with a huge, huge anomalous force. And when I read the patent of Walter Jenkins, after seeing that video, I read the patent. I couldn't believe it with my eyes because he did what I said to do last year, I said to do this, I was as, as a experimental suggestion, he was actually doing it. And he did not know me and I did not know him. And he was actually doing this. What he did was he used an ultrasonic fogger to make fog particles, cloud particles, and he put it in the internal combustion engine with a wide plasma spark plug. And that spark plug was the essence of his invention. His provisional plan, his, his provisional patent was that spark plug. He fires it at an extraordinary voltage, not way above the 50 kilovolts that are normal spark plugs. He's firing it at 100 to 200 kilovolts. He said that spark plug design was inspired by the Tesla coil with the high, with the big sphere on the top of the Tesla coil. It inspired him. He fires that spark plug for the entire duration of the downstroke of the piston. Now, who does that? Right? The entire downstroke of the piston. So he was working a pulse plasma anomaly, a huge force from the plasma. Had nothing, nothing to do with hydrogen combustion. Well, how can a fog particle be a fuel? After all, it's nothing more than a symmetrical droplet of water. And an abrupt electrical discharge will typically just blow it apart. But if it's small enough, it can dimple in towards a torus form and support a ball lightning event, a creation of ball lightning, microscopic ball lightning. The ball lightning is a plasmoid. It's a, tor it's a vortex ring that closes on itself. And there's an inherent stability to that. The only way that they can possibly make that is with a template of matter of some sort where the implosion of the spark pinches it in and forms the vortex ring in, 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 as an entity. And this has been the theme of my talks ever since I started the investigations of zero-point energy uh, from 1975 on, that this type of form caps the zero-point energy. And thus, ball, ball lightning coheres the zero-point energy. I'm going to explain why in just a second. When I first started, uh, back uh, was really 1974, which inspired me, was the work of John Wheeler, Geometrodynamics. He had a model of the vacuum, what he called the quantum foam. It was basically the zero-point energy flux uh, from, from quantum electrodynamics that forms this particular form of the ether. This is a model of the ether, but it's a very, very powerful model of the ether because it's not just a liquid hydrodynamic model. It's basically a virtual plasma. It's a virtual plasma model where electrical flux enters our three-dimensional space and exits through many white holes and exits through many black holes. And this, this, is, this was not my idea. This was Wheeler. I couldn't believe it. I'd never heard of such a thing as, as a systems engineer. I was getting my PhD in systems engineering, never heard of this stuff. And then when I read it, I got completely converted. What if this could be tapped as an energy source? 
So basically, this was Wheeler's model. It's a higher dimensional flux from a higher dimensional space. So imagine our space is this plain, flat land, and it's like a rainstorm coming through. That's the zero point energy flux. It's related to the pace of time. It's related to the Kozarov experiments regarding the pace of time because vorticity can influence it. And so on the left hand side is the incoherent vacuum fluctuations that just come through. They just see it as the turbulence of the vacuum, the seething vacuum that Wheeler would call it. And if there's a slight tilt to it, they call it a polarized vacuum. And there's a slight component in our flatland stop, slot. That flatland slot represents our three dimensional universe. That's what we can see. If there's vorticity coming through it, then that constitutes the elementary particles. So in this model, as that flux flows through, the vortex, just like the flow of a stream, maintains a whirlpool. The flow of the zero-point energy flux maintains the elementary particles in existence. All of the elementary particles owe their existence to the zero-point energy flux. The flux is related to the pace of time. That relates to Kozarev's work. It relates to the speed of light. That's why, how, why light propagates at the, at, at, the, at the speed that we observe. It bends the space-time metric, bending space-time. That means artificial gravity, gravitational propulsion, inertial propulsion. This theory opens up the ability to do a flying saucer-like type of technology with our science as we understand it today. In the turbulence of that, it produces electron-positron pairs. This is standard quantum electrodynamics, where these turbulent pairs come into existence, go out of existence, come into existence, go out of existence in the turbulence of the zero-point energy. All of this arises in the vacuum fluctuations. The key to exciting the vacuum is the vacuum polarization of the nucleus. This is standard electrodynamics. The lines of vacuum polarization converge steeply on the nucleus. Thus, if you abruptly jerk or surge the nuclei of any plasma, you will start to bend some of that zero-point energy flux into our three-dimensional space and manifest excess energy. That's why all these events to trigger excess energy always involve an abrupt electrical discharge to jerk those ions. By the way, I credit T. Henry Moray, the famous inventor, that recognized that the ions, jerking the ions, was the important component to tapping the zero-point energy. And if, how do we trap it? We trap it into the plasmoid. The zero-point energy is trapped in the, in the, into the plasmoid by this precessional motion where it's a spin of a spin to close the vortex ring, like a slinky closing on itself. It ortho-rotates. That means bend at right angles. That into that ball lightning entity, and that ball lightning entity always exhibits excess energy, and more importantly, it exhibits an, a very fast acceleration, an abrupt acceleration. That acceleration can propel a piston if it's microscopic ball lightning. So we see self acceleration, excess force, and excess energy from these ball lightning events. Is there any evidence in nature? Thunderclouds. Every thundercloud exhibits with lightning. Every lightning bolt, John, played, has a ball lightning precursor on it. And the way we learn this is from high speed photography. Could you play it, please? Just push play on the right.
<laughs> May I have this dance, please? Hold on. Oh a second. wow! But, uh, it played last year. <laughs> Jeez. Did Which you get one? Windows 10? <laughs> How many of you have been badgered to get Windows 10? <laughs> Which one is it? Every hand should be in the audience. Wait, which one is it? Uh, oh, let's see. Lightning Multi. Play. Push play. Push play. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's a single lightning stroke. We're, we're on the millisecond time frame. And look at all those ball lightning precursors. This should loop. Loop it again. Play it again. Notice how when the lightning strikes, boom, all those ball lightning events come right down the main stroke that hits the ground. It happens in nature every time. Thunderclouds are doing it completely. Last year's talk was basically thunderclouds are tapping the zero point energy. And that's where they're getting their energy for lightning. Thank you, John. I know that was difficult. There's two more to come. <laughs> I'll try to do better next time. Yeah, let's get back to the slide. Okay, jump me ahead to the... Thank you. I'm on the slide. But that's below the lightning cloud. You ain't seen nothing yet. What about above the lightning cloud? Uh, they got the Sprite activities. And the Sprite is an incredible event. Uh, that event lasts less than a one thousandth of a second. It is, this is a big lightning stroke behind, this is the thundercloud. This is what's going on on the top of the thundercloud, underneath the lightning stroke. This event is 50 miles high, 30 miles wide. I can't get wide it off me. <laughs> For less than a thousandth of a second. It's, it's, it's incredible. They're just pure luck when they go up and try to shoot these things with high-speed photography. Now they're at a million frames per second just to capture the event. And there's some uh, YouTube, there's some YouTubes up capturing it. All right, John, you're up again. This, this is a, a loop video. <clears throat> and the monkey pushes the button. It comes from the halo above, right? And then there's the event. One one thousandth of a second, this event. This is a zero point energy event that's cohering to zero point energy that quickly above the thunderclouds. There was a great documentary um, on the History Channel about how they even were able to record this. What they do is they get up in the plane on a thunderstorm, thunderstorm and they aim on the top of the cloud and just cross their fingers because they're just shooting a million frames per second hoping to get something and eventually they luck out and they get it. Okay, thank you John. You know when I grew up I want to be just like you. <laughs> well, now you, you are. Man. We're you one, man. brother. We're one. You man. You man. <laughs> so what's going on, man? It, look at the size of that thing. And they're composed of ball lightning, but they're huge. Ten meters. These big, fat, fat, <laughs> fat ball lightning events, right? At the tenth of the speed of light, right? Launched from the halo. And then they, they observe gamma rays and antimatter and everything else. They're all intrigued, right? And it didn't occur to them. They're tamping into the zero-point energy or they're rotating that zero-point energy into those uh, ball lightning events. And so, do we have any evidence and experiments? We sure do, right? Back in 1907, the professor at Harvard University, Trowbridge, Notice that when he squirts a little mist, water mist, into an electrical iron, it's a lot louder than normal. And 
Professor Schrungel in Germany during the war noticed the same thing and he measured it well enough to know that the force was not from heat or steam. Right? And he later applied it to a, a sounding device, an echo sounding device to get reflections off the bottom of a lake, to map, map the bottom of a lake. Peter Gnu at MIT, a professor at MIT, really measured this event. And what he found, just an abrupt capacitor discharge in water, and it has to be very abrupt. If it's too slow, nothing happens. But if it's abrupt enough, it launches the weight up into the air. And he can measure the height of the weight. And he can see, whoa, I got a lot of excess force here. And in, in addition, with the photography, the high-speed photography, he was able to measure a plasmoid event in the heart of the electrodes, where the electrodes were firing. But he also didn't measure all the energy. He blew out the volts, bolts, in his containment device. He didn't even measure what he was really, really getting. But Gary Johnson, a professor at Kansas State University, electrical engineering professor, repeated Peter Gnu's work designed spherical uh, weights that, were, uh, that would contain the water. He would discharge the capacitor. He knew the energy on the capacitor. It would blow the weights up the glide, guide wires. He would photograph with, with how high they flew up. And now he truly, truly measured. He had excess energy, more energy than was on the original capacitor, not to mention excess force. And he quietly published in one of the engineering proceedings in one of the journals, and it was quietly ignored. Right? He didn't have an explanation. And so that is the best of the overunity experiments in academia in existence today. Very quietly done. Imagine if cold fusion was done this way. Oh, we have a heat anomaly. Okay, quietly reported. What would happen? Would you even know? They had to shout, fusion, 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 right? To even know there was something amiss. And of course, the backlash came and everything else because there was something else going on besides fusion. They didn't know at the time. Well, Gary did it the appropriate scientific protocol. If you don't know, say you don't know. You don't have to explain it. You made your measurement. It's very repeatable every time. You published it in peer-reviewed academic proceedings, right? And what happens? <laughs> you need a little marketing, don't we? <laughs> That's our job. Let's market this stuff. <laughs> well, there's a website that exploring, can we tap this as an energy source? Let's do explosions in the water, very abrupt capacitive discharge, and it must be very abrupt. You get no effect if it's very gradual. Got to be abrupt, abrupt capacitive discharge. And the latest experiments by Peter Gonneau and the team, he teamed up with George Hathaway and his lab. He had a high-speed photography camera, and they associated the anomaly with the micron fog particles. So they knew it had to do with the fog particles. My good friend David Faust, who have been a fellow researcher for years from the time I started, uh, was an expert on curling photography. And there were events in curling photography that reported to him uh, regarding a ball lightning type event coming off the, off the apparatus, very microscopic a type of event where it would persist, a ball lightning event would persist. And what he had, at, at the university was low light level cameras, state-of-the-art cameras, that he got at the university, and he was able to just do one discharge, one abrupt discharge, and he could always record a, a ball lightning event every, practically every time, sometimes lasting for persistence of a minute. Little did I know he's anticipating the research of this man. He's my hero, Ken Shoulders. I did not discover him until 1991 when he finally went public with his research with his once his patent was granted. And he discovered what he called 
uh, EVs or uh, charged clusters. A lot of people talked about this. And it was a rather simple experiment. A very abrupt pulse from a capacitive discharge uh, would launch a small ball of lightning onto a dielectric and it would persist. And if it would run along a path and it would hit a conductor and then would dissipate and create a crater. And he could do this repeatedly every single time. And he wrote a wonderful patent. He didn't write it in legalese. He authored it himself. And, and Ken Shoulders was a true genius. Uh, he went to, to Texas A&M on a scholarship at age 16. Uh, got thrown out of Texas A&M at age 17 because he was doing practice. He, he said, I wasn't quite ready for that. He went immediately into the industry. Uh, but that, that's a wonderful patent. It's fun to read because he's doing all the application of these EVs. And what uh, he discovered, or what Mesiats, uh, in uh, Niani Mesiats was in Russia. He was the, the head of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He loved this experimental work and he proposed this theory. He says, what happens on, a, on the event is that the tip of the sharp pointed electrode melts. It melts and a liquid protuberance of liquid metal sticks out from the tip and blows the tip of that off. And the circulation of the plasma around it converts it into the ball of lightning, converts it into the vortex ring form. Right? and makes the EV. Notice we need a symmetrical matter form, a blob of liquid metal on which the discharge creates a, a vortex action around it to convert it to the torus form of the ball lightning, the plasmoid form of ball lightning. Uh, they measure, he called it electron volatum. That's where the EV stands for. It's Latin for strong charge. Once he was convinced that that entity trapped excess energy from the zero-point energy or the vacuum energy, he renamed it to EVO, exotic vacuum object. And they manifest a charge approximately 100 billion electrons, drags along a million ions. It always seems to exhibit the charge to mass ratio of the electrons. And they contain excess energy. That observation of that charge to mass ratio is a recurring theme in Ken Shoulder's work. He detected some positive EVs. Now these are highly anomalous because once again they show that charge to mass ratio. Now it's like the positron, but they're not comprised of, of a cluster of positrons. He gets no gamma rays coming off it when it hits the electrode and, and dissipates. Right? It's, he felt that this was something very, very fundamental to the way the vacuum wants to manifest charge from the vacuum. Remember, vacuum likes to do pair production of electron-positron pairs. It's the charge to mass ratio of the electron. On a large scale, this is at the micron scale, the same ratio keeps manifesting. He felt he was probing something very, very fundamental about the nature of the vacuum and thus tapping the vacuum energy. He would get power production. He would make dual EVs and they would oscillate around themselves. They would orbit around themselves and when he struck the uh, metal electrode, they would make dual craters. He would make black EVs. Now these would go dark for a while. Right? And then he could give us a voltage pulse and bring them back to life. And I believe this is what Dave Faust was measuring with his low light level intensity cameras. They weren't quite dark. He was able to keep seeing them. But Ken Shoulders was observing this phenomena in his work. He claims the biggest over unity experiment in existence. He, he traveled across the country disclosing this, including going, ending up on the East Coast with Peter Grinnell. He stopped in Utah and visited me for, for nearly a week. He said, this was the experiment. He would create a vortex through one of the boreholes. It wasn't very big. It was on the order of a millimeter of water, a vortex of water. But if he shot an EV down the borehole, he would create such a huge, powerful pulse that it was 
extraordinarily over unity, just that one pulse. Because he knew the energy on the capacitor, right? It wasn't very much to launch the EV. And he called this the cascade effect or coherence effect. So you can take a matter vortex, and when you ionize it with a coherent entity like an EV, you can make it extremely powerful. Now the problem was, he couldn't find a way to harvest it. He said anything that thing struck would destroy it, would punch a hole right through it. It's like shooting a bullet through a windmill blade. It's a complete mechanical impedance mismatch. He didn't find a way to harvest it. And for, for I think they were going five or six years trying to find a way to harvest it before they finally went public and he was willing to disclose this. They just gave up on, on this. But this experiment is probably, I agree with Ken Shoulders, the biggest over-unity manifestation. Very little energy was taken to make that EV. And not that much energy was taken to flow the water. And what you get on the other end was so huge that um, I think they want to classify it. So why do some electrolyzers succeed and most fail? It's because they make abundant nanobubbles. And this was the new information for me that I just learned from last year's research because I did not know that such entities could exist. I was in good company, neither did the water community believe it. Basically, a nanobubble is measured, they can measure them down with laser backscattering down to five to 700 nanometers. The definition of nanobubble uh, is loosely defined as anything that's submicron in, in size. Uh, the purists say it should be under 100 nanometers, but nobody really uses that phrase. There's the theoretical minimum of a water cluster from theory that you, you make the three nanometer uh, nanobubble, so that's the holy grail, so to speak. Uh, Martin Chaplin has a wonderful water site. Now, Martin Chaplin is a professor at the London South Bank University, and he keeps his water site current. What he does is he constantly stays abreast of all the water research in the world and constantly keeps references on his website. That's the number one website. By the way, this slide deck will be available to everybody. See, you don't have to take notes. Just sit back and enjoy, because I'll have it up on, I have the slide deck up on the web. And so basically, nanobubbles, uh, they call the bulk nanobubbles in the liquid. Uh, the surface nanobubbles are interesting. And they're interesting because there's something called superstability. This blew their minds. They could not believe that water, liquid water, could form such a structure that it could withstand a shock wave. And in their, their experiments, their shock waves are like almost plus or minus 60 atmospheres of pressure. Boom, boom. Right? And they're like little igloos on a hydrophobic surface that don't get destroyed. They, they can boom, boom, hit that thing, and it persists. It takes a licking and keeps on ticking. <laughs> so what makes nanobubbles? Well, we're going to find out what I found out from this. All electrolysis makes nanobubbles, naturally, all. Cavitation makes nanobubbles. We'll find that microchannels of, of airflow can help make nanobubbles. And of course, ultrasound can make nanobubbles. So we'll look at electrolysis. Here's the stroboscopic, microscopic images. And the, the, the nanobubbles will naturally glow on the electrodes to microbubbles. Now, microbubbles aren't so stable, right? And they'll break apart and release the hydrogen. But if you could just blow them off the electrodes quickly enough while they're in the nanobubble state, you would have that nanobubble template. Remember, it's a template with the spark plug that makes the ball lightning. It's the nanobubble itself that's important. And that's what Archie Blue did. There's a patent on back, way back in 78. Nobody believed him. Archie Blue had a vehicle running on water. You know, and what did he do? He blew air through the electrolyzer. Well, what does that have to do with making hydrogen? Absolutely nothing, right? What does it do? 
you shear off the bubbles before they grow to micro bubbles, and now you have nano bubbles getting into your internal combustion engine. The nano bubbles are stable. Cavitation is famous for making them. Now, basically, cavitation makes vacuum bubbles to, that collapse and launch a re-entry jet. They make a natural torus on the cavitation bubbles. So that's a vacuum bubble. And here's an example of it from Wikipedia, that the entire pressure of the collapsing vacuum bubble squeezes it in and concentrates all that pr pressure into the reentrant jet. And that reentrant jet has such pressure on it that it's actually temporarily in a solid state form. At huge, at those huge press pressures. And Mark LeClaire, who I've referenced in the past talks, is an expert on cavitation, says that that state is solid state and it's a macroionic water crystal. And what that does, it cleaves micro bubbles very naturally. Before they get too big, it cleaves them in half and they make nano bubbles. And that's why many, many of the nano bubble uh, cavitation devices uh, succeed in making long persistent nano bubbles is because whatever they're doing in their mix, they make micro bubbles in the mix, the cavitation, collapsing cavitation bubbles cleave them uh, before they grow too big, and now we got the stable nano bubbles. Norm Wooten will be talking about his patent tomorrow night, and it was one of the better of the cavitating devices, and right in the gap, where the number 32 is, he impresses two counter-rotating vortices coming through the two holes. Right? One from the rotor, coming up from the rotor mark 12, and coming down from the stator, stator area, two counter-rotating vortices colliding in the gap. And that's the big event that makes nanobulbs. And I'll talk more about this uh, on Saturday at 2 o'clock about his device. And Friday night, that's, that's Norm Wooten's featured presentation. So I, I expect him to really cover it. Uh, snapping blades make nanobubbles. This is the work of Ryushi Namasa, who I covered last year. And basically, if that blade snaps, it's a flexible blade, and if it vibrates up and down and snaps quickly enough, it draws a vacuum behind it and launches a nanobubble right behind the blade. And Omasa hit the scene in 2009, announcing that he was making this from, he would mix electrolyzers with a mixer that had that vibrating blade. And it would, uh, he could feed that gas into an engine with no extra air and run the small engine. Uh, there was basically a parallel plate electrolyzer. He stored his gas under, under pressure for over two years and it would still work. This is a very important point. When he stored his gas, he made sure his containment leaked loose hydrogen. You don't want to store loose hydrogen with oxygen under pressure. Trust me, you don't want to go there. But he intentionally leaked it. His containment was weak, and it would allow the hydrogen to vent away, and it could store whatever it was in his water cluster. And it's because of the university professors that helped them, they finally analyzed, wow, you're making nanobubbles of hydrogen from your electrolyzer with those vibrating blades. And he, this, this YouTube he hit in 2009. Well, let's keep going. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the social will be ready in a little while, but with your permission, we could actually run Maury for about another 25, 30 minutes. Uh, do we have everybody's permission? Sick him, dog, I mean, sick him, Maury. Thank you, sir. I don't want to rush. And basically, here was, here was his electrolyzers. Uh, the flexible blades are vibrating up and down. And there are the electrolysis plates. You know, Omasa was an expert on mechanical mixing. He didn't even try electrolysis to late in the game. 
And then when he combined the two, boy, did was he surprised on what he got. He was my number one pick. I featured him last year as the best protocol for every time creating a huge event from these electrolysis projects. Here's a closer up of the, he talked about the angle of flux, fluctuation of those bay of blades, they were flexible. He had holes in his electrolysis plates. That's an unusual thing to do. In fact, his holes were 50% of his plate area. So if you're trying for hydrogen, you wouldn't do that. And so what he did was the reentrant jets from the collapsing cavitation bubbles would be able to enter the electrolyzer through the holes. He empirically discovered this. He, Omasa no peaked in 2011. They had a new special in Japan at prime time where they featured for an hour his discovery. And they showed, uh, here's his acronym uh, for a masa gas. Notice its name sounds just like his name. The acronym. <laughs> what synchronicity? <laughs> There's, a, there's an image of the plates. You can see how wide they are. They're, these are the blades that fluctuate back up and down. Snapping them is extremely important. It's the snapping action that launches the cavitation bubble. You need to very abruptly move it. Got, got scooters running completely on the gas. Uh, with the cars. Well, he's, now he's adding some natural gas. You know, some... Uh, Propane, that's peculiar. Generators, this is where you can make your energy measurements, running gen sets. Um, there's a graphic, I still need to get that translated from J Japanese, that implies two, two kilowatt hours in, five kilowatt hours out. Uh, this graphic, I did get translated, they were mixing with propane. Now, what are you doing mixing with propane? You're doing a scientific experiment. He announced in 2009 he found a new form of fuel to save the planet, right? And all of a sudden, he's mixing propane into this experiment. Did he not run a small motor, most small energy, purely on the gas? Was he not, not, not any extra oxygen? I really believe Amasa was suppressed. In fact, there is nothing on the web after 2012 on Ryushin Omasa. Silent. And so this obscures the energy discovery that he made. There, that applies 10 kilowatt hours in to make 10 to 20 kilowatt hours versus of Omasa gas. Right? Well, who needs the propane for this experiment? So there is an intentional obscurity going on here. So another thing, microchannels can help make nanobubbles. Uh, Alex Putney, this is a good website, uh, talks about biocharcoal to make microchannels. And you can blow gas through the microchannels. And here's an example of, of, from wood, what the microchannels look like. And the biocharcoal nozzle, a very cheap way to make it, although it's fragile, it's fragile. And then the flow, low pressure gas naturally yields nanobubbles. And the implication here is, gee, let's get away from electrolysis. All we need is the bubbles, right? If they're stable, and we just need to surround them with, with plasma to make the ball lightning, right? To heck with electrolysis. We could go right to nozzles. The carbon-based ceramic nozzle uh, coming out of Japan, Japan has led the revolution in nanobubble type technology. John, could you play this, please? Going for you right now, brother. That's it. Just, just say open. Uh, Maury, we're not on mine. 
It's not to be online. Okay, uh, do we have that in another form? It's MP4. Just play it. This one? Yeah. Hmm. So you didn't bring it down. That's a shame. That, that was... Uh, I'll tell you what, John, you could try to bring it down. You, 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 that's a link. It is not the file. Okay, we, what we do is we'll say, wait to the end and see if you can find the file. You just brought down a link. Cause I, Should I check it? It has a link symbol, so that's too bad. This, this was a good video because it showed the, it showed the measurements from the lasers that they were really making it from the nozzles. So you know, I guess you'll have to come, I'll, I'll show the length, the long video of this, uh, two o'clock on Saturday, when I talk about the nano re bubble revolution. Let's just move on. You don't have, you did not bring the file down. So. Let's, okay, I can move on, I guess. So basically, what was critical here was the, the channels in the nozzle weren't quite small enough to make nano channels, they were just micro channels, but the shear of a very rapidly water flow across that nozzle ended up making nano bubbles. It was the shearing activity from a very high speed water jet against the nozzle. And the big, big breakthrough that this, uh, this inventor made in Japan was the fact that he could make abundant huge abundant nanobubbles easily. And they were focused on oxygen. And what they, have, what they got, well, they could recover an entire seabed, right, in a polluted, uh, in polluted Tokyo Bay. And I'll show that video in full um, on, on Saturday at two o'clock on what his discovery was. Okay, um, we, let me move on. Is that, is that we'll, just, we'll just cover it Saturday. No, is that the video you're looking for? If you can hold play on. it. No, that's not. Okay, hold on, hold on. That, let, let, don't worry about it. We're, we'll see it on Saturday, okay? Let's just go back to the slides. So why, this, this is answer the question, what happens on electrolyzers, uh, surfaces, right? Why did some electrolyzers succeed? Because they made a surface that mimics a nozzle, that mimics microchannels coming, on, on the, on, coming through during electrolysis. This was part of the conditioning, the conditioning of electrolyzers. Wow, did you, did you just get the video? Is there any sound? Is that, is that the one you were looking for? Yeah. Get it. Let's see how the nanobubbles are used in a simple water tank. A jet of water is coming out from the pump on the left. 
Once it's plunged into the water, this small nozzle produces micron-sized bubbles that further shrink as they travel through the water, turning into nanobubbles. Using a microscope, let's take a closer look at how the bubbles shrink down to nanosize. After a few minutes, the bubbles have gone from tens of microns to tens of nanometers. This is the carbon ceramic nozzle we saw earlier. The porous nature of the ceramic allows air to flow through. Apparently, it was impossible to produce nanobubbles with non carbon based ceramic. The system was developed not by a major company, but rather by a small factory run by Anzai Kantist. Their original technology has baffled many experts. There already existed several types of nanobubble systems, but all were complex and very costly. It wasn't too surprising that researchers were skeptical when they were first told that nanobubbles could be produced simply by sending air through a small ceramic nozzle. showed that nanobubbles remained in the water after the nozzle was taken out. The bubbles which normally can't be seen with the naked eye reflect light as they pass through a laser beam. Regular bubbles normally disappear quickly, but nanobubbles last for a long time, which is why they were detected by the laser. Thank you, John. Great catch. I have to confess, I cheated. I watched your thing, I watched your presentation already, and I recorded it on a different laptop. I was so curious about that link, I forgot that I recorded it on a different laptop. I cheated. It happens. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. Yeah, but you made a good catch, so we got, we got, we got to record it, and I'm not under a time restraint, so it doesn't matter. We're free. We're free tonight. So, basically, why did some electrolyzers succeed and others didn't? If you just make an HHO device, you likely will never run a genset self-looped, right? You don't do it. But after conditioning electrodes, right, all of a sudden some inventors are claiming success. So it's remarkable. So I was really, really curious once I had the nanobubble hypothesis, how could it be? And it had to do with what's going on when you condition an electrode. And what's happening is you're building up a residue on the electrode while you're doing electrolysis. And you're punching channels through the, through the, through the electrode. And these channels now allow nanobubbles to be emitted prior to making microbubbles, which just break apart and just emit free hydrogen. We're now starting to emit a lot of nanobubbles from that. The, the, so to make the microchannels, you need kind of a gentle periodic electrolysis, and you've got to be cleaning the crud from the water. And the gradual accumulation of the electrolyte precipitate gradually builds up on the electrodes while the emitted bubbles are carving channels. And so we basically, on the electrodes, mimic making a nozzle. Uh, Ravi Raju is the most extreme, absurd case that I've, I've, I've seen in the literature of, of building up something on the electrodes because he was trying to replicate Stan Meyer's standard electrolyzer using tap water in India. Please, tap water from India is not a controlled experiment. The only thing you know for sure about tap water in India is that you mustn't drink it. Well, he contacted Dave Lawton. Dave Lawton was a heavyweight, competent engineer. He worked for uh, Harnwell Labs uh, up in England, in London. They, they have a, Harnwell Labs has a reputation like Lawrence Livermore. This guy really knew his stuff. He retired. He decided he would start to do the Stanmeyer research on the replication work. And so he is very successful in replicating Stanmeyer's electrolyzer. And he advised. Ravi Raju on how to condition the electrodes. And he said, we got to clean it up while conditioning. You got all this rust crop, crud coming out of the electrodes. Just keep cleaning the water. And you have this conditioning process. It's rather meticulous. It took a month 
to keep repeating it, right? But after that month was done, he created abundant gas coming off of it. He thought it was hydrogen, but it was actually nanobubbles, and he showed what the conditioned surface looks like. Very, very important. Do not touch it. You have an extremely fragile precipitate on the electrodes that have carved channels. And if you touch it, you wreck it. Right? So that's why it was, you've heard in the HHO literature, never touch the surface after it's conditioned. This is why. Bob Boyce, uh, give a big kudos to Bob Boyce, who you'll hear from him tomorrow at four o'clock, because he did more by sharing information with the entire HHL community in the mid-2000s to launch a huge movement of successful replicators and successes in the HHL. So big kudos to Bob. And what Bob shared was the conditioning process, just using the potassium hydride in distilled water, and it only took three days to do it. So he conditioned it. Now people were successful making abundant gas, kind of following in his footsteps. So Bob Boyce, I, I, I credit for really changing the world because he created massive replication across the entire HHL community. And then after you condition those electrodes, you don't even need electrolyte. So you have a precipitate, of, in this case, of the potassium hydroxide on the plates. Three days, that's all it took. I've, I've heard rumors, I tried to, to research this, that graphene is even better. I've, graphene electrodes, graphene-coated electrodes, were producing results of six liters a second. Six liters one second. Other people were doing six liters a minute, maybe 10 liters a minute. Six liters a second, right? I tried to drill on it. Oh man, it went proprietary. Could not get any information out. So I was tr trying, for, trying for that. Now, <clears throat> it's possible in normal, just electrolysis, if you have enough plate area, you know, and you have enough current, it's all about current, right, to make, you could do this, you can fulfill this claim with enough surface area and enough current on it, just standard electrolysis. So it's not out of, it's not out of the norm to, to, to do such a thing by standard electrolysis. But I got wondering, are they making nanochannels on this graphene surface? So that kind of got me to the edge of my research. And I will be speculating more on this idea on, on, on the Coffee 8 conference. So energetic fog gas from electrolyzers. That's what we really want. We don't really even care about hydrogen. Isn't that amazing? It's not about hydrogen. It's about making ball lightning from fog particles. And so Yul Brown really uh, launched was the first to detect the energy anomalies in electrolyzers. And so he proposed atomic hydrogen. He could not explain the anomalies. So he just proposed that as a hypothesis. It stuck. He was the first inventor to observe in the welding application the anomalies in the Brown's gas torch. He proposed a hypothesis. It was atomic hydrogen. And the entire community got stuck. It has to be atomic hydrogen. There could be other hypotheses. That's what I'm proposing. It has a cool flame. It's just a little bit above the boiling point of water. You could run your hand through it. It doesn't boil water. It's so cool. Yet, it can vaporize tungsten. Vaporize tungsten. Right? No welding torch could do that. Here's, here are the numbers. Right? The, look at that low temperature on the Brown's gas torch. And look what it takes to vaporize tungsten over 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Right? None of the welding torches can do it. And yet the Brown's gas torch could do it. This was the big clue to me. I knew all about Ken Shoulder's work. Right? And I immediately knew back in 2006 when I started my research, this anomaly is not from hydrogen combustion. Right? It was from EVs. We're launching microscopic ball lightning events, EVs,
because what can they do? When they strike a metal, they just make the electron bonds let go. Electron bonds just let go. And that's why the tungsten just vaporizes off. It's a coherent interaction with this microscopic ball lightning event that did it. And that sealed the deal for me. And I knew there had to be ball lightning there, but I knew, also knew you had to have a template to make it. And for years, right, starting in 2007, there's got to be some type of water cluster there. There just has to be. And I didn't know what it was, right? And you guys have heard me over the years. You got sick of hearing it. <laughs> there had to be a, a, a template there to make it. I did not know it was what it was until last year when I learned about nanobubbles and their, and their stability. That was the template to make the ball like uh, George Weissman recognized it pretty early on. He called it electric expanded water. He said, no, there's something there, something there. He thinks it's a liquid crystal structure. So I credit him with the first to recognize it back in 1996. Other people have observed it. Uh, Ron Mitchell was on a YouTube where he, he observed the cool fog. It wasn't steam, it was very cool. Coming off the electrolyzer, it would just happen now and then, but it was a, basically a fog, a fog gas coming off. Uh, HHO Mist, this is a nice YouTube, which just shows the turbulence on top of the water. All this turbulence. And the turbulence has advantages because it can break the microbubbles up into nanobubbles. So in all that turbulence, we get a lot more nanobubbles. So basically, that's the reason for the narrow gaps. The sputtering and the turbulence and the cavitation tied on very narrow gaps breaks up the microbubbles and the nanobubbles, the nanobubbles are stable and they can convert to ball lightning. The Anton cell was a very good example coming out of Germany. They did a very good job. It was used in one of the, one of the events where one of the electrolyzers claiming to be self-running, Jen said, because of that narrow gap. Steve Eaton was one of my heroes. Boy, he was a flash in the pan trying to go open source. 2009. 2009 was, in my mind, the peak of HHO. We have OMASA in October 31st, 2009, coming forth, announcing to the world he made his, his OMASA gas. October 30th. Two weeks later, November 13th, Steve Eaton tried to go public with and go open source, sharing the information on his device, his electrolyzer, that likewise made a self-running gen set. And what he did was he had an extremely tight gap. He used a little fishing line. See that spiral up the fishing line? That water would sputter up. All the gas activity would sputter up. He had to make a long, long enough tube, and then he was able to self-run the gen set. Steve Eaton was an engineer. A uh, master's degree in nuclear engineering was a hell of an inventor. If you ever go to see some of his YouTubes, you see this guy's first class capable, really competent guy. Tried to go, and the next thing you know, uh, within, within a, a month, he tells Jeff Sokol, his partner, get all my stuff off of YouTube, I'm done. No more communication. Right? I'm pretty sure he got suppressed. And everything was removed. So that was the peak of HHO. I felt Steve Eaton would have punched it through with what he did as an experiment. Oliver and Valentine in Germany played around with that cheapie. That generator was terrible. I mean, you might be lucky as an internal combustion engine to get 15% efficiency. It was a cheapie Chinese generator. They jerry-rigged the uh, timing so they could Fire the piston at top dead center. That's with all that uh, apparatus is on it. And they made it self-running on a cart. So they peaked, I think, in 20, 2012, trying to show, show off, look, we're riding this cart in an elevator. We made a closed loop self-running gen set. And they were very active prior to this in the various blogs on the HHO community. Then after this video went up, They likely were likewise suppressed. No more communication from those two. 
injecting water mist. Well, if we just want the bubbles, like the mist is naturally going to have very small, tiny water particles in it. And of course, we get the Stan Meyer. And the doom buggy, the famous doom buggy. And this is the invention that got Stan Meyer killed. Right? The water injector plug. He was injecting mist. And here's the Canadian patent. He would inject water, ionized air, so it wouldn't be hard to fire the spark plug. And some argon, that's curious too. Now, uh, McLean, McLean Lee was scheduled to talk about this tomorrow. He didn't show to the conference. And so I guess it's my job now. <laughs> it's a nasty job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so there, there it was. It's like a shower head, right? The, the ionized air is the middle ring. The rare gas is the outer ring. Rare gas is curious. Why, why is he doing argon? And the water mist coming through. But he got enough of it to drive the piston. No electrolysis. There's no hydrogen making here. This, he wanted to mass produce this at a factory. And what happened on his, on his death, he, uh, he was closing with some Belgium investors, presumably, at a celebration dinner. They were to make a factory to make these injector plugs and to retrofit the world. The advantage there, you can retrofit automobiles, right? All internal combustion engines could be retrofitted with the injector plug. Well, I'm sorry, this was too revolutionary. And if you've ever met Stan Myers or heard his YouTubes, that man would not be bought. Reminds me of the Blue Brothers, Blues Brothers. He was on a mission from God. <laughs> he was going to deliver this humanity, and the money didn't matter. So, you know, he had... I guess he had to go. It was not a simple device, right? They had to use lasers to pre-ionize the air because it's hard to fire the spark plug, right? You're only firing it in the water now. There's no hydrogen. There's no combustible gas. So they had to pre-ionize the air to get, even get the spark plug to fire. And the ultrasonic fogger has been suggested and played around with. There it is on the website, a blog talking about using that as part of the HHO investigation, so it's not a new idea. And that's exactly what Walt Jenkins was doing. In fact, his patent was claiming that. And 1.6 megahertz, why that frequency? Because that's where the little pond foggers are sold really cheap out of China, so people can put, put it under the water in their pond and make a lot of visible fog. It's optimized to make visible fog. And that's why that frequency is, is chosen. And uh, it's even hard to buy these days, just a pure ultrasonic fogger, because they, they want to beef it up with some old, you know, LED lights to, to, to make the light, the fog red, green, blue, and change colors and everything else. It's just hard to even buy a straight up ultrasonic uh, um, uh, transducer anymore. <laughs> In other words, you got to get the lights for free. You got to rip them off. <laughs> well, here's what's interesting. You know, the ultrasonic frequency and what it makes in the water is related to wavelength, right? The, it's an inverse relationship. One point, around one megahertz, you get about a particle of, of you know, 1,500 nanometers, and that gives you plenty of visible fog. But if you want nanobubbles, even smaller, you would go up in frequency. Right? They have a smaller wavelength. The higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. And you get some smaller particles. This region has not been explored. Nobody has any reason to explore ultrasonics up at this region to make smaller and smaller nanobubbles. Right? It's, it, this is a great tip for inventors because there might be, in water, natural resonances somewhere up there at those high frequencies, like 100 megahertz, that make the very small nanobubbles, where the water naturally wants to make a lot of them. It's, it's never been explored. Not easy to explore, but this, this opens up a realm for inventors to really optimize the right bubble. And imagine what you see. You don't see it. Right? The gas, now the, the mist is too small. You don't see the particles. So you've got this invisible gas 
coming off a very high frequency ultrasonic vibrator that magically runs the engine off of water. It looks like a miracle. But what you need to really make it go is that wide plasma. Because you've got to convert those nanobubbles to ball lightning. So the, high, the big abrupt plasma, the big wide plasma spark plug is exactly what Walt Jenkins did. He put it all together. Imagine this, this inventor worked alone. He didn't, he didn't know me, he didn't know any of this. He completely did it on his own. Ultrasonics plus a wide plasma spark plug. He, he should get all the credit in the world. To punch, he punched it through, the whole thing. Right? And notice he fires it for the full downstroke of the piston. He, he, he controlled his electronics so well. So I asked Walt, I had a phone conversation, how did you learn your electronics so well? Not only do you fire it at top dead center, but you kept firing it for an entire downstroke of the piston. Nobody does that for internal combustion engine. And I said, what did you learn to do that? He said his dad, as a child, he learned from his father, uh, who was a, he said was an ingenious, a genius le electrical technician. And he learned his electronics. Uh, he has the knowledge of an electrical engineer, full-blown trained electrical engineer, doing this type of, of spark plug. This was his provisional patent. He said the Tesla coil is what inspired him. That dome on the top of the Tesla coil, right? The dome on the top of the electrode, so that plasma spreads. And so, Walt J. Notice the voltage too. That's not a little 50 kilowatts typical firing of a spark, right? He's up there above 100 kilowatt volts, right? All the way up to 200 kilovolts. Fired for the entire downstroke of the piston. I guess I'll go this way. That's right. He knew that that would have to keep it going. He did not know me. I contacted him. I shared my result, my work with him. He says, wow. I says, if you don't have enough gas in there to be combustion. You, you're, and he says, you know, you're right. I don't, I don't even heat, heat the generator. It's not hot when, when I write it. He can overdrive it, just like they showed in the video, that it seems to have a lot of power. If it's a small lightning anomaly, it has so much force from that acceleration driving that piston, you really don't need a lot of gas to do it. Robert Krupa was famous for trying to market a wide plasma spark plug. This was basically for gasoline ignition. It was common sense, right? The bigger the spark, the more gas you ignite. Hello, right? And, and so it got no traction at all. Problem, problem was, spark plug never wears out, right? Now it exceeds the duration of the car. But, and the spark plug guys are going, well, he ain't making any money on that. We may build one, uh, we sell one, that's all we have to sell. So they didn't like it. Here's a prototype from experimenters that were replicating it. The patent showed a lot of uh, electrode configurations to make the wide plasma coming off of it. Uh, notice the dimpling. That was clever. He discovered this dimpling empirically because what happens when you dimple the spark plug during the high voltage, it forms a glow plasma in, in, the, in the dimples, in the, in the crevices. It's like a hollow cathode electrode, which is actually well known and well studied. And then when you fire it, you get a big wide plasma coming off of it. So you, pre, you, you have a pre-plasma in, in, in the crevices of the dimpling. And so that gives you nice uniform wide plasma. That was the important thing, the wide plasma. Because we're not igniting and burning something, we got to convert nanobubble droplets into ball lightning. So we need all the plasma we can get. And uh, here's an example of the plug from the And there's racing car spark plugs designed to do this type of thing. They want to burn the gas, as opposed to putting it in the catalytic converter where the oil companies want you to burn it. And the pulsar plug is this beam. So these are commercial plugs. Uh, there's a capacitive discharge plug. That's the idea. If you, you know, discharge a capacitor all at once, you get a lot more plasma in the plug. And uh, 
Here's a patent uh, by uh, David Yurth, who was a speaker here, but Mon Rolfs is the actual inventor. He's, he's out in, in uh, California. He's a, a, Russian, a Russian guy. And they, that team, they finally got his patent on the wide plasma spark plug. It's very similar to Walt Jenkins' plug in geometry. Their stress was on the metals. They knew that, that for this to have long longevity, they had to have good metals that could, that could you know, withstand all the discharging coming off and not just wear out. Uh, this video Dave Yurth shared with me from, from a project they were doing back, I think in 2012 time frame. Could you play this, John? Now the fond gas is coming from the bottom. So he, he uses a counter-rotating magnets stimulating an electrolyzer to make a lot of fog. So you can see the visible fog coming on the video. This is the plug firing without any gas. It's just this normal firing. That's a lot of fog gas in here now. Thank you, John. Um, Aaron Murakami, he, he helps run the conference up in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I got, I got to meet him. I spoke up there for the first time. Uh, he had, with his team, they, they had a very clever circuit. Uh, intended for gasoline engines, but, uh, but I immediately realized its potential is the, the inductor collapse that normally makes a spark for normal discharges simply closes the spark gap. And once that closes, it acts like a closed switch, and then he's able to dump the entire capacitor into the spark. There's a brilliant invention. When he showed, when he, when he was uh, giving his talk up in Coeur d'Alene, uh, he, he said he had to wear goggles and earmuffs. That thing was such a big discharge. It's big plasma discharge. This is actually an ideal circuit to drive the wide plasma spark plug because it dumps a whole capacitor mimicking the, what Peter Gnu is doing and what uh, um, can, can, um, at Kansas State University Gary Johnson was doing to dump a capacitor discharge very abruptly. And here's a circuit that does it. And I said, boy, you should apply this to these water electrolyzer ideas. And uh, they really like the idea. But that's the drive that makes it ideal for the PAP engine. It's the same principle to drive the PAP engine. Basically, PAP was driving off the noble gases. The wonderful thing about noble gases, this is the, the inert ga the gases on the right side of the periodic table, they don't combust. There's no combustion at all. It's a wonderful controlled experiment. And what's not readily known, but it is known in the standard scientific literature, that if you can take a mixture of inert gases up to a plasma state and back down again and back up to the plasma state, they naturally form into clusters, stable clusters, that provide the very symmetry we're looking to make the ball lightning. This would explain the PAMP engine. We're making microscopic ball lightning from the inert gas clusters. And what Pap had to do, he worked with some radioactive material to, to ionize the gap so it could fire the spark. 
right? If you work with a circuit like, like Aaron Mariachi had, you don't need that anymore. You can just fire that spark straight across. Notice when the piston is closed, it makes it into a full big vortex ring. So that you can imagine all this microscopic ball lightning also creating a macroscopic vortex ring as it flows around that, creating the cascade effect, the type of thing Ken Shoulders discovered. If you can circulate a lot of those into a big vortex, for him to come up with this, I'm convinced that Pat was channeling from beyond or something. He had to have some contactee stuff to even come up with this idea because it's right on the money to produce huge, huge anomalies, uh, force anomalies. In fact, his first patent was an explosive device, right, rather than the engine. And I said, that's the weirdest patent I've ever seen. Who would go to all this trouble just to blow it up once? It's, 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 it's absurd, right? And yet, his, the forces were so powerful in this, he could drive the piston. So, the PAP engine is an example, uh, I say, the purest science because it completely removes combustion as the explanation for what the hell's driving the piston. Right? The same thing's happening on the water. And that's, what, that's why uh, Walt Jenkins is the hero here because he removed hydrogen from the equation. And basically, that's the pulse plasmoid engine. I've talked about this in the past. Just huge anomalous force, and the actual source is the zero-point energy to drive the piston. Such a thing allows us to retrofit our current technology. So to wrap up, the closed-loop self-running genset is a spectacular claim. Combustion can't even come close to explaining it. I mean, you're, if combustion were to explain it, you lose so much energy in that, in that engine, from, from heat losses, right? You'd have to be 5x over unity just to overcome all the losses in the circuit. So something else happens, ha has to be going on besides that. Besides, electrolyzers don't necessarily, do not make excess energy. Therefore, really, hydrogen combustion can't explain the anomaly at all. It can't be that. Instead, it's taking those microscopic, or not better yet, nanoscopic fog particles, pinching them into torus in response to the abrupt electrical discharge to make the plasmoid form, the ball lightning form. And that exhibits self-acceleration. Self that is what propels the piston. It's like a microscopic flying saucer drive type of discovery. And if you make a vortex of it, you get a bigger energy anomaly still by coherence of a vortex, by the cascade effect. The water arc experiments finally showed it was the fog particles that were the source of the anomaly. Lots of ways to make the nanobubbles. They're just a template to make the ball lightning. Electrolysis, conditioned electrodes made the microchannels. The nozzles do it directly. That's our future, the nozzles. And of course, ultrasound. You need that wide plasma spark plug. That's what converts something that has really no energy in its, of itself into the ball lightning. It's that plasma that converts it from that spark plug. And thus, we made a pulse plasmoid engine from these projects. Huge anomalous force. Essentially, the energy source is indeed the zero-point energy. Uh, the inventors had different methods. Uh, Stan Myers finally settled the injector plug, not electrolysis. Ryushi Amasa had the cavitating blades, so snapping blades to, to make the nanobubbles. And Walt Jenkins just cut to the chase and used ultrasound to make it. Walt Jenkins is destined to be the next Stan Meyer. There's his doom buggy that he made. It. He won the 2011 HHO games for that dune buggy. He's the next hero in, in this industry. He put it all together. He took the pond fogger and combined it with the wide plasma spark plug. He mimicked the thunderclap, took thunderclap material, put it into the combustion engine, and mimicked what a thunderstorm naturally does. Nature does it. 
mimic the thunderclap, and change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maury Kane. Now, before we have the questions, I have my advertisement. I have the book.